Welcome to Breadboarding. This is video 32 of the Breadboard 8088 PC series with PC compatibility part 10, where we're testing the DMA controller. Now in the previous video, we tested the interrupt controller and the timer, and we also showed that the floppy disk controller was working to some extent, but that the bit that probably was failing was the DMA controller. We ran out of time to do that, so now we're going to be looking at the DMA controller. We have another look at this diagram that we looked at in previous videos. What we can see here is we've done the interrupt controller, we've done the timer now, and now we're just going to be looking at the DMA controller. There's a DMA address latch which handles the A8 to A15 address lines, and then the DMA page register handles the A16 to A19 address lines because the DMA controller can only do 16-bit addresses. So in the previous video, we managed to stabilize the system and pretty much sort out most of the ongoing issues. And the only bit that really was failing is that when it came to boot the operating system, going to boot MS-DOS, then the floppy disk drive would access and buzz a little bit. But when it came to actually transferring the data off of the disk drive, then it was failing. And the transfer of data from the floppy disk drive to RAM is the purpose of the direct memory access controller. Now, these are quite complicated and I must admit I never really understood much about the internal workings of DMA before doing this project and there is a good book so the Intel microprocessor handbook I think it is I'll include the links and the details in the description below but there is a section in here that actually explains about how DMA controllers work how an example design or how to use one which doesn't necessarily match the PC and then there's some sample code. Now, one of the things you can do with a DMA controller is actually copy one area of memory to another area of memory. Now, I don't believe the PC actually uses this, but I thought well, that might be a good example to try and test the DMA controller. And there happens to be an example in the book here, which I've used to sort of guide some of the work that I've done here. And if we go back to look at what we've got, so the DMA controller has four channels on the original PCXT, and normally this is to read from I.O. and write to RAM, and to read from RAM and write to I.O. However, it is possible to do RAM to RAM, and what it does is uses one channel, DMA0, I think, to read the data, then it stores that byte in a temporary register in the DMA controller and then it uses a DMA1 channel to write that data out to RAM. It's on page 502, 503 that I've referenced there. So what I've done is I created a fairly simple test program. So let's take a look at the first test program I've done for testing the RAM, the RAM transfer. So DMA test one, what this does is initially creates 512 bytes in the 5000 data segment so this is sort of in the middle of the RAM and it writes an ascending series of bytes to the 7800 range so all this loop does is just clears AL and in a loop just basically copies 0 to FF two times in in that area so we actually have some data in the RAM. This creates a section of RAM 7800 upwards for uh, 512 bytes that we can then use to copy. So 7800 is the source. We also need to write 05 to the DMA address register that handled the A19 to A16 values. So what we have here is we're outputting to the DMA0, DMA1 page. And if you remember, because of the way how the addressing on this is handled, that DMA0 and DMA1 share the same page port 83. We need to clear the flip-flops between writing the least significant bit and the most significant bit just to make sure that everything's okay. We also should clear the interrupts as well. So we clear interrupts before doing this. Then what we do is we set the source address. So we write the least significant bit first, then the most significant bit. 7C00 is the area where the floppy disk boot sector should be copied to in order to start up the operating system. Then we have to set the count of the number of bytes, so the count is in fact going to be the 512 minus 1, so we normally just decrement that. So we then write the count out. 
Then what I have also done as part of the debugging here is then read back the current count and the current address, and I'll explain the reason for that in a few minutes. Then we have to set the mode for the channels. So the mode for channel zero is to be reading, and then the mode for channel one is for writing. So effectively one read, one channel reads the data from RAM, stores it in a temporary register, and then the other one writes it output, writes it out. Then there's a special bit in the control register which enables the memory transfer. So bit zero, I think, needs to be set to one. So that sets memory to memory, and that enables this sort of DMA zero and DMA one. Then we enable the channel by clearing a mask bit, and then we can actually do a register initiated transfer. So rather than needing to use the physical pins on the DMA controller, we can actually use a request register to initialize the DMA. So this basically sets uh, DMA zero to be active. And then basically there's a, a loop here in the code that just goes around forever. And again, I'll explain about that. So basically what this should be doing is initially putting some ascending bytes in 7800 for 512 bytes, then it should be copying it to 7C00, and we should end up with the same range, so 0 to FF twice in that memory. So what I'm going to do now is to run this and show you the logic analyzer output and then try and explain why this is not working properly. So when we look at the logic analyzer output, we just need to remember that the DMA channel 0 is going to have 7800, DMA channel 1 is going to have 7C00, and we're going to expect to output 511 bytes, which is going to be 1FF. Now this is important when we actually come to look at the logic analyzer output. So I've got two outputs here from running the test. The first one here, we can see that we've got the DMA controller chip select. So we've got all of the writing to the DMA controller. Then when it's actually active and it runs, what we can see here that the H request is the line that basically requests the CPU to hand over control of the bus to the DMA controller. Hold acknowledge comes back from the logic. So you can see if we look at the gap between the two here, we have from requesting the bus to the CPU granting the bus, this is about uh, 800 nanoseconds. So it happens in a, just a couple of clock cycles, so it doesn't take very long. You can then see the DMA enable low, that enables the address latch for A8 to A15 and also the 4-bit register that we use for the A16 to A19 address lines. And then the ANBRD, the AN board, that goes high and that basically disables all the buffers for the CPU, so the address buffers, the data buffer and also the 8288 bus controller will also go three state. This means that now the DMA controller has got access to the bus and this address strobe line that we've got here, what this does is this is actually taking the value that's on the data bus, which we'll look at in the other logic analyzer, and basically it takes the value on the data bus and stores that into the address latch. So this is going to result in the A8 to A15 values being loaded into the address latch. And if we count to see how many of those we've actually got, so from the beginning there to the end, And if we just add a pulse counter for channel three for that range, right, for the B range, so we've got 10, 1,020, so maybe just one or two less than what we might expect. So it looks from that view of things that things appear to be working okay. Now, if we take a look at the other logic analyzer output, there's quite a lot more here, but we're going to do zooming down onto this initial bit down the down the beginning here. And there's two things I want to to show. So what we have down here is the again the address strobe that is loading the 
A8 to A15 values from the data bus. But we can also see here we've got the IO writes and the IO reads to the chips as well. So if we're just going to try and have a look and seeing where we're sending the various addresses to the DMA controller. So here we're writing to 00, zero which I think should be DMA0, starts with writing 0 there and then the other one here should be 78. So writing 7800 zero, zero to there and then the next then we're having to clear the flip-flop really don't need to do this uh, when we're doing things sequentially like this but I was just putting this in just to be sure. So then we've got DMA1 values so we can see we've got 00, zero there being written and then we'd expect this to be 7C so this is correct so we've actually written the correct values there. Then also after we've done that then we also then write the counter and so to the DMA1 counter which is address 3 we write FF and then the other value we've got then is 1. So 1FF one is 512 minus 1. So we're writing that out. I think, in fact, that I read back the counter first, then we do the two addresses. So when we read back the counter, we're getting FF back, so that's OK. Now we expect to have 1 coming back in this another one. But in fact, what we actually see, we get 3. So that's not right. Then... We're reading back the DMA1 value here, and we're getting 2 here when we expect to see 0. And rather than 7C, we're getting 7E, which is 2 more again than what we expect. So it appears that the values that we've written here are actually coming back with the bit D1 actually being set. Now when we have a look at the address strobes here, so this is where the DMA control is starting to copy data from one place to another. And we can see here that associated with these that we've got a read uh, followed by a write. So if you have a look and see what the address is that we've got here, so we've got the A0 line there. There are some of the address lines decoded down here. And in fact, this value down here will appear as, although it's um, data segment 5, Zero, zero, 0, because we haven't got the A16 here, it appears as 2, because uh, that's effectively one bit shifted down. So basically when we see zero, 02 there, it, it is effectively accessing the 5000 zero, zero, zero range. So what we see here is the address strobe, and this one, that when the address strobe is, we output 78, so the 78 goes to the address latch, and the address that we're actually reading from is 7800, and we read 7800, we read 0 there. So that looks great. So then it then loads the 7C00, so we see the next strobe here, 7C00 gets loaded into the latch, and the address here is 7C00. And then we write the 0 out to that memory or location. So that looks good. I mean, when we first, when I first looked at it, I thought, oh, great, everything's working fine. We can see here it then does 7801, 7C01, 7802. Then suddenly it goes to 7E02. This should be 7C02. And if we have a look here, that the address strobe here loads 7C, then 78, then 7E. So somewhere on the lines, we're getting an extra bit set here. And to cut a long story short, I've gone and redesigned various bits of the board. I've changed the DMA controller so that it only talks to the address latch with a separate bit of bus, which is separated from a, another buffer. And all I can assume is, that in fact, that there's a fault with the chip because all we're doing early on in that test is writing value to the to the chip and then reading it back again and it, it appears to be 
not working properly. Now I do have a spare of these which I've uh, tried as well. Unfortunately that is even worse. It actually has a couple other uh, data lines actually cause problems with it. Now these chips are from 1980 so it's probably not unreasonable that sort of 44 years after they were made that there may be some faults with them. So what I have done is I've ordered some some more recent ones from Intercell which I think are new and hopefully those will arrive at the end of the week and I'll be able to resolve this issue. So the DMA controller seems to be causing a problem and this stray bit I have done lots of uh, troubleshooting to work out if it's anything to do with my wiring but uh, that's not the case. What I might do is to hook up on the XG Pro test configuration may try and actually write some values to these registers and read them back just to see whether or not it, it is actually the board or whether it is the chips but I'm pretty certain it's the chips and I swapped out the chip and the other one had problems with the I think the D6 and D5 lines as well so that was a problem. Then I thought there could have been an issue with the RAM to RAM testing. So what I've also done is a second test where I've modified the code that I had here. And all I've done here is we're actually using the same RAM area that we used for this. Only what we're doing now is using this to write the RAM out to the power on self test port. So I rewired the power on self test port. And what I did is use the request three to hooked up to the port B um, D3 connection. I wired in the DAC to the, port, the post port clock so I basically changed the wiring on that and that then was going to read from the RAM and write to the post port. Now that didn't result in any joy either and had similar problems. So in summary the two DMA controller chips that I've got appear to have some sort of faults with the data line so particularly the D1 and D7 and possibly D6 as well uh, I think on the second controller might have been faulty. Now I have actually tried uh, separating the DMA and address latch data lines out from the rest of the data bus so this is a bit like the original X bus in the original PCXT design that we discussed a number of videos ago and decided that perhaps we didn't really need it. So I thought, well, perhaps there was a reason for it and that the DMA controller just couldn't drive the number of data lines that we needed. So what I, I did do is rewired the board to add in an extra bi-directional buffer just for the DMA section of the board. And I programmed uh, the PLDs to do the necessary data enable and direction signals for that. That really didn't make any difference. And so what we were seeing really was that when the DMA controller was writing to the address latch, that was for the A8 to A15 lines, that in fact, rather than writing 78 to that register to give us the 7800 address, it was doing 7A some of the time. It was doing 78 sometimes and 7A other times. And then similarly, when it was actually writing the destination address, which was generally should have been in the 7C range, that it was doing 7C some of the time, but it was also doing 7E. And when we also read back the values from the registers and from the counter, we also saw that when we read the values back, then in fact it was coming back as a 7A or 7E. And in fact, when we read the counter which should have been 1FF which is 1 less than 512 it's 511 and that was coming back as 3FF so it certainly looked like the chip that was installed on the board from the beginning really had a fault with the D1 bit which was providing the, the 2 value so we were ending up with an extra 2 in some of these things here. The two test programs I've got so the two tests I did were I called 1 and 2 but in fact the test program was called test 3 indicate there's a fault in the 1980 AMD DMA controller chips. Now, I was looking online and on some of the forum posts, Sergey Kisilev had said to another person who was trying to get DMA working that he had actually used Intercell 82C37A DMA controllers. Now, these are, are available from eBay and they are new rather than sort of second hand. So I've ordered a couple of those and hopefully those will arrive by the end of the week and I'll substitute those in. Uh, hopefully that will make everything work. If not, then it will at least allow me to narrow down where the problem is. What I might also do is to use my EPROM programmer has test mode. I'll write some tests to actually try 
testing, uh, saving the register and reading the register values back on the two DMA chips I've got at the moment. And that should allow me to verify absolutely that the chips are at fault rather than the wiring. So in our plan here, in the previous video, we managed to verify that the interrupt controllers and timers were working. Also that the floppy disk controller certainly was working to an extent, but that the DMA controller really was where the failures were occurring. And we've just been able to verify in this video that it is actually the DMA controllers that seem to be causing the trouble. So once I get these new chips, I'm going to swap those in and hopefully we'll just be able to then boot up MS-DOS from floppy disk without any trouble at all. I'll finish the video here and I'll provide an update fairly soon as soon as I get the new chips. And then what we'll be able to start looking at is expanding the current breadboard PC to add some extra features like the real-time clock and a disk controller. And that should allow us to be able to install MS-DOS from the hard disk and be a little bit more flexible. And then we'll start to look at building out other things like a CGA video controller adding the mouse and seeing if we can even run Windows. So if you don't want to miss out on future videos, please hit subscribe. And if you could hit like if you found the video interesting, just helps to make the video available to a wider number of people. Thanks for watching.